Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Health. We have a lot happening around City Hall today, so my colleagues will be coming in and out. We have a big hearing in the main chamber and, and a budget presentation on the other side of the building. Uh, I know there's great interest from my colleagues in this bill and this hearing, and uh, I know many will be joining us uh, throughout our discussion today. We're going to have an unusual format for me, at least in my committee hearings. Um, this will be the first time that we're not asking the administration to present first. We're going to be hearing from a member of the public uh, who I'll say a word or two about in a minute. And I'm also going to dispense with the uh, generally long and formal opening statement, uh, and just briefly say a few words about this issue before we hear from the most important person. Uh, we're here today to talk about birth certificates, which have a very formal legal role in our society. They are used for access to employment and education and financial services. They have tremendous practical importance, but they are also a very powerful symbol for someone. They are commonly called the foundational document of someone's life. They have a uniquely powerful symbolic role for all of us. And so it is particularly painful to think that there are some people, some parents, some mothers, who must look at that document and see the name of someone who has abused them. I'll explain what I mean. This is because of the uh, not hypothetical, now documented instance, instances of medical providers, obstetricians abusing mothers and then appearing on the birth certificate having delivered the baby. So these are abusers. These are, in many cases, people have been convicted whose name is enshrined forever on a document which will follow a child through life, through adulthood. That's unacceptable. That can be fixed and should be fixed very easily. The city has the power to fix it. And we're here today to consider a bill that would do that in very simple form. I want to preemptively respond to one point which I've heard from detractors of this bill, which is that any uh, mother who wishes to strike the name of an abuser off this certificate can simply go to the courts. That's not acceptable for a lot of reasons. Going to the courts is expensive, it's time consuming, it's complicated, it can be humiliating, it makes the information public of abusers who don't wish to have their information made public. It's unreliable. The legal system has failed in the specific case we're talking about today. Legal systems fail. And it's simply not the way we have dealt with other important public policy priorities related to birth certificates in, uh, in years past in New York City, which I'll talk about in depth later. Um, I'm going to pause now and invite up and invite up our first witness, Marissa Hochstetter, if you could please make your way up. One of the bravest and most determined people I've had the chance to work with. I want to thank you for joining us today, Ms. Hochstetter, and tell you that I understand, at least theoretically, that it can't be easy to step forward, but I'm grateful that you have, and I admire you for doing so. And I would like to now give you a chance to testify about your experience and, and your position on this legislation, please. And there's an on button on your mic. You got it. Thank you. While this is difficult, I'm grateful for the opportunity to address the Committee on Health today. <clears throat> I've publicly shared my experience in an effort to help shed light on sexual assault by medical professionals. 
on the failings of the criminal justice system in supporting survivors when they do come forward to report crimes, and, and on the long trail that trauma leaves in your life. This bill, would, this bill allowing the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's Office of Vital Records to redact the name of a physician from a birth record when the physician's license has been suspended, surrendered, or revoked by the New York State Office of Professional Medical Conduct would be a tangible step towards justice for me and others like me. I'd like to start by thanking you, Councilmember Levine, for introducing this legislation in response to my advocacy and in support of survivors of sexual assault. I'm also grateful to Council Members Margaret Chin, Keith Powers, Helen Rosenthal, Coleman Yeager, Donovan Richards, Andrew Cohen, and Steve Levin for their co-sponsorship. I'm privileged to have an amazing community supporting me and would like to also acknowledge my husband, David, my family and friends for their unwavering support. Also my friends Lee Graham, who's here with me today, Marissa Elkins and Kate Carrera, our attorney Anthony DiPetro, Assemblymember Dan Port, and finally Albert Samaha, whose thoughtful telling of my story in BuzzFeed News last summer helped me get this out and start bringing the many injustices that I and others have faced to light. The assaults and subsequent experiences seeking justice have dramatically altered my life. I'll try to be brief today and to focus my remarks specifically on what it means for me to have the name of a doctor who abused me on my kids' birth certificates. A few years ago, while registering my twin daughters for kindergarten, I had to present their birth certificates. I hadn't really looked closely at them before, and when I did, I saw that listed under name of attendant at delivery was Robert Haddon. I was shocked. I was pregnant during all but three of my visits as Haddon's patient at Columbia University and New York Presbyterian Hospital facilities from 2009 to 2012. During that time, he performed overly touchy exams, made inappropriate comments about my body, examined me without other people in the room, and on my last visit, undoubtedly sexually assaulted me. When I realized what was happening, I never went back. I turned inward to protect myself, my new babies, my marriage, my job, my life. I'm still haunted by what else he did while I was unaware. He so clearly took advantage of me during the most vulnerable time in my life. The assaults poisoned my memories of my pregnancy. I felt like a failure as a woman for not turning him in. I felt like a hypocrite as a mother telling my daughters to be truthful and question things. How could I ask them to do those things when I hadn't? So after much deliberation in the fall of 2015, I reported the assaults to the Manhattan District Attorney. When I went to their special victims unit, I learned that I was one of more than 20 women who had come forward. The ADA told me that my accusation was outside of the statute of limitation, something I would later learn was not true. By Vance's office was already negotiating a plea, and I saw later that the timing of my report was inconvenient for them, and they chose not to act on it. In February 2016, Haddon pled guilty to crimes against just one victim, a criminal sex act in the third degree, which is a felony, and forcible touching, which is a misdemeanor. Two very minor counts called down from a long list, a list that would have been longer had the DA included me and others in the case in Molyneux or with a second indictment. As a condition of the plea, Haddon had to surrender his medical license to the state's Office of Professional Medical Conduct and agree to not seek licensure elsewhere. He got no jail time and received a nauseating guarantee of immunity. The DA agreed to never charge him for additional conduct that had turned up in the course of the investigation. It felt like they were saying the crimes against me and an untold number of other women never happened and now they could never be tried. Because my abuser was well connected and supported by his employer, he was able to effectively just retire. Much has been reported about the campaign contributions Vance received from Haddon's defense attorney and the chair of Columbia University's board, so I won't digress here except to say that Vance's justice system trivialized the fact that I was sexually assaulted, and anyone who was culpable has effectively ignored their responsibility or bought their way out of it. I share all of this to say how empty the experience of coming forward left me. I did the right thing and came forward, turning to those in this city who were supposed to help me. 
Instead, I was discarded. When friends swap birth stories, I cringe. I never want to share my own. My C-section scar makes me sick. I knew I'd never see Haddon again after watching him plead guilty in court, so why do I have to keep seeing the na his name on the birth certificates? I knew that to find some closure or acknowledgement of my pain, I had to get his name off of those documents. In some states, that information isn't even listed. You can order new copies online, you can request changes for errors, but you can't change the name of a person who attended the birth. After new, nearly two years of unreturned phone calls and emails to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, I received a cryptic email that read, your inquiry is currently under investigation and we will inform you when an answer is received. I never heard anything further and two attorneys helping me at different times couldn't get anywhere either. I refused to give up though. City rules allow anyone attending the birth to be listed. If this had been a home birth, it could have been my husband's name, and for that matter, it could have been my name. I did do the work. <laughs> Eventually, the department told me that they'd need an order from the state Supreme Court to make the change, but I was advised that a court might reject such a request because Han's name is not there in factual error. So I obtained a letter from the hospital where I delivered offering, <clears throat> offering an alternative name, then maybe the change could be made but unfortunately Columbia and New York Presbyterian where Haddon worked for more than two decades refuses to acknowledge the role they played in enabling him. So getting a new letter isn't an option. That brings us to the introduction of this legislation. Haddon continued seeing patients even after the police and the DA were notified of the allegations against him in June of 2012. There are dozens of known victims. I'm the only one who's not anonymous and probably hundreds or even thousands of, thousands of others like us out there. His own defense attorney said during the criminal trial that he had over 30,000 patient visits. Almost all the victims that I'm aware of were pregnant when we were assaulted. And for 10 of us that I know hadn't delivered our children, that's 13 babies that carry his name on their birth certificates. I sit up at night thinking about how many babies he must have delivered in his career a privilege that he used to gain access to women's bodies. The worst part of all of this for me is that he's the first person in the entire world to touch my children. I can't change that. His hands physically took them out of me during my C-section and they're the same hands that abused me. I hope the administration and the council finds the courage to do something different than the way things have always been done. I ask that you support the bill so that children like my daughters don't have to keep the name of a serial sexual criminal on the document that marks their entrance to this world. It's a small ask, but a meaningful one. Thank you. Thank you very much for that eloquent opening statement. Is it okay if I ask you a couple of questions? Okay. Sure. Um, how do you respond to the suggestion that this could simply be worked out in the courts? Well, I've had conflicting information, um, and I think to ask someone like me to um, have an attorney come forward to a court, um, you know, I'm not anonymous, but I know of a lot of other women who don't want to be public about this, so bringing it to the court requires a different level if you want to um, be anonymous. I think what's unique about this legislation is that it does require that the doctor has lost their medical license by the state's Office of Professional Medical Conduct. So there is another um, body in the state that has already weighed in on um, that licensure. Just want to focus in on that because I think that was yep. so key. Could you repeat the name of the entity that would make a decision in this the case? Office, the Office of Professional Medical Conduct is the um, state body that licenses medical professionals. And um, there are limited ways, but there are ways that they will um, either suspend, uh, take, re revoke, or a doctor can surrender their license. And I shared part of the, the plea that the DA did make because it required him to surrender his license. Um, so in this case, this is a person who has admitted guilt um, to 
crimes against women like me and has surrendered his license and is no longer practicing. So that's um, not up for debate. I think that's a very important point. The legislation relies on a very clear standard. Mm -hmm. There's no judgment calls here. It's based on a decision by a professional medical, uh, a, a statewide body, uh, which presumably uh, doesn't make such determinations lightly, or maybe not even that frequently. Do you happen to know how many people lose their license a year? How many board certified obstetricians? I don't know that number. I know there's something like 90,000 doctors in New York, and there's actually a lot of advocacy around uh, medical boards in, in different states. Um, New York State does not have open records about doctors, so there's no way. You can only see final actions. Um, so if you were to go on the, the Office of Professional Medical Conduct site, you could see had enlisted as having um, surrendered his license and the reason why. There's no way for us to know if people have been um, filing complaints against him for years that were potentially investigated but did not result. Um, I will say that since coming forward, I've heard from hundreds of other women who were either victims of Haddon or other um, uh, OBGYNs. I think that we will only continue to see more people uh, reporting uh, assault by medical professionals. So it's, it's really hard to know. There's very little research or kind of information out there. Well, as, as commonly happens, when one brave person steps forward, other people then find the courage to step forward as well, and that's clearly happened in this case. Mm -hmm. Of the, you said it was hundreds of, of, of women who you have learned of since you came forward. Could you estimate how many are in New York City? Um, I'd say I've heard from, let's say 50 people who were Haddon's patient. They don't all live in New York City anymore, but you know, I mean, that's where the birth certificate is from. That's where the, you know. Of course. Yeah. And I think we would be naive to assume that Haddon was the only abuser ever in the history of New York City. Sure. And part of the reason why we need public policy action is uh, to protect people who we don't yet know of uh, so that they don't have to go through what you've gone through. I mean, it's not unlike any other um, situation where you have someone and someone else in a position of power. So you go into a medical office, you're there for a reason, you're pregnant, you're looking for their expertise and their help. Um, so it's, it's not unlike other discussions we're seeing around sexual assault in other industries. Um, and medical professionals, doctors use that to their advantage. Um, you're alone in a room with them, and there's often a legitimate reason why their hands might be on or in your body, and it's a, um, they use that to their advantage. And, and that's clearly what happened um, in my case. And there, I, think, I think there are 100,000 babies born a year in New York City, roughly. Someone can maybe correct that number for me later. But even if it's only one in a 1,000 or one in 10,000, cases, the numbers are still significant in New York City. And we need public policy that protects everybody and that doesn't require someone to be heroic and spend years fighting as you have. And in my opinion, public policy that doesn't require people to go to the courts because of the reasons I mentioned earlier. I wonder if you could say anything else about your experience dealing with the courts in this matter. Do you know of fees that might have been charged or any other, uh, anything else you can help us understand about your experience to the extent you've dealt with the courts on this matter of getting had his name off the birth certificate? So I haven't taken it as far as actually, you know, taking it to court. I've had two different, um, this is something I've been working on for about four years. So I'd, I've had two different attorneys at different points working on that um, and either have received no information, there, there's, there's very clearly a lack of precedent, right? And so anybody who did respond to me or, you know, people were supportive, but they didn't know what to do. There's a lack of precedent. So I think um, 
I would say that the council in, in New York City has an opportunity to make a statement about um, what, what this means for people and the privilege that I think it also signals to doctors the privilege they have and that you know if they abuse that they um, they can't abuse that. <laughs> And uh, just want to understand your experience in dealing with the health department. You described two years well, of attempts. Well, now it's been four years, yeah. Mm -hmm. But could you explain more about the ways in which you attempted to communicate and to the extent something came back or, or whether there was simply silence on the other side? Um, I've tried emailing, phone calls. Like I said, I've had two different lawyers make outreach to different, you know, I'm not sure necessarily who their contacts were, but um, uh, I was pretty much radio silence at first. And, you know, this is something that's hard for me, so I'd say I sort of come in and out of my ability to do it. Like, I get the birth certificates out and I'm motivated, and then it's, it's traumatizing, it's difficult to to look at them. Um, so I've kind of come in and out of it and I think, you know, it's been six months and nobody ever wrote back. Um, I did after a year and a half get one email that was, um, like I read, it was very cryptic. Um, uh, I think... That was the first communication a year and a half in. Yeah. To, to, to me directly in response to, you know, submitting an inquiry. Um, I think maybe I've had one or two other formal responses that were also very vague and not specific. Um, I got one that said, you know, um, dear parents, thank you for your inquiry kind of thing with no, and it didn't feel like it was specific to me. It felt like maybe it was sent to a bunch of people who had pending inquiries. So I've had very little communication. Yeah. Dear parents. Yeah. Did you confirm whether anyone else involved in this case received such an email? Do you, do you know whether no. others have been? No. Have been I am in touch with a few other women who I know want this change. I know that there are 10 of us in this. Um, I know of nine other women who were patients of Haddon who uh, want his name off of their children's birth certificates. But I'm, to my knowledge, I'm the only person who's, you know, done this. and. Um, once you tell people about it, it makes sense, but it's not something that maybe people think of um, at first, but you know, the fact that he was the first person to physically bring them into the world, like it's now part of their story. And you know, you take a birth certificate when you get a passport, when you get married, like any number of things like you mentioned, and he's there and I just don't think that he deserves to continue to be a part of their story. You know, now that I've been speaking publicly, like of course one day they will know about this. Um, I hope that they will be proud of what I'm trying to do. But I feel really strongly that he should not continue to be connected with them and their life. I, you know, that's something that I have to carry and deal with, but it's not, um, that's not fair to them. Thank you for your very powerful words and for your courage and for being here today. Um, it's incredibly impactful and I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, if you're able to stay uh, for the rest of the hearing, uh, we would welcome that uh, in case other questions arise. Um, but, but for now, um, we are gonna pass on to the administration and, and uh, thank you for speaking out. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for listening. So would DMA, DOHMH like to join us? Okay. And is it commissioner or deputy or assistant commissioner uh, Van Wy? Uh, thank you for being here. And I'm going to ask uh, committee counsel Sara List to uh, administer the affirmation. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Okay, please. Okay. Good afternoon, Chair Levine and members of the Health Committee. 
My name is Gretchen Van Wy, and I am the Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Vital Statistics at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. On behalf of Commissioner Barbeau, thank you for the opportunity to testify on Introduction 1308. New York City is one of 57 jurisdictions in the United States that registers births. In each of these jurisdictions, the registration of a birth begins with a physician or other professional attendant witnessing the birth of an infant. The Health Department's Office of Vital Records is responsible for issuing birth certificates for all births that occur within New York City. We work closely with other jurisdictions and the federal government to maintain a system that upholds the integrity and security of this essential vital record. Birth certificates are legal and medical documents for which factual information must be corroborated by external parties. In the United States, a birth certificate is our primary identity document. It is proof of US citizenship, afforded the full faith and credit of other jurisdictions and countries, and is honored by US states and other countries. There are two forms of birth certificates that are issued by the Office of Vital Records. The short form birth certificate otherwise known as the certification of birth, contains only the name, sex, date of birth, place of birth, and parents' names. The short form can be used for vote most purposes, including applying for a state driver's license and a US passport. The long form birth certificate contains all of the items on the short form, plus other information, including attendant at delivery. All United States birth certificates begin with the medical certification, and federal law mandates the national collection and publication of birth and other vital statistics data. A variety of national standards exists for the reporting of birth data to promote uniformity and comparability of data across the United States. Under the New York City Health Code, when a birth occurs in a hospital or en route thereto, the birth certificate and the confidential medical report of birth are required to be prepared and certified by the physician, the licensed midwife, or the re registered physician attendant in, in attendance or assisting, or by a certified nurse practitioner or registered professional nurse present or after the birth, or by a designee of the person in charge of the hospital who is trained or approved by the health department. The attendant is swearing to the facts of birth on the birth certificate that they are correct. This is critical given the importance of birth certificates as fundamental identity documents. The requirement to display the certifier's information on the birth certificate also exists in New York Public Health Law, which governs the vital records processes for the rest of New York State. This is also the standard set by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which sets a national exemplar certificate to promote uniformity and comparability of data across the United States. In New York City, the only information on a birth certificate that is subject to amendment by self-attestation is the gender marker. In discussion with other states and advocates over the past several years, the health department found that the gender marker was not something that can be corroborated by anyone other than the individuals themselves. All of the other information on the New York City short and long form birth certificates can and must be corroborated by an external party through submission of documentary evidence. This includes paternity, time and place of birth, parent's name and signature of those present at birth, including the physician. The requirement of documentary evidence or some other form of proof is a fundamental legal tenet. It is also codified by the US Model State Vital Statistics Act, which the Department of Health and Human Service promulgates in coordination with the 57 vital records jurisdictions to provide models for the development of local laws and regulations. For anyone seeking substantive factual changes to their birth certificate, which have legal implications, the health department requests a court order certifying that the requested information is valid. This is the process all applicants follow when they seek an official proclamation defining legal relationships among the parties listed on the birth certificate, including name, paternity, or presiding physician. I would now like to turn to the bill under discussion today. I want to be clear that Ms. Hochstetter's experience with her former OBGYN is horrific, criminal, and should never have happened to her or anyone else. The department stands ready to assist her in the process of removing the presiding physician's name from her daughter's birth certificates. We support the intentions of this legislation as reflected in our commitment to helping Ms. Hochstetter and anyone else who wishes to pursue a change. I would, however, like to note that there are legal considerations that we must take into account in altering, in altering our process. 
We look forward to working with the council to ensure that our processes continue to be fair, just, and equitable. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. This hearing will generate important conversations. I am happy to answer any questions. I'm really stunned right now at the stance of the administration and I may be missing some things. So I just wanna give you a chance to clarify. So you're not supporting the bill. We are on your side. We want to continue to discuss the bill with you. Okay, but we've been joined by Councilmember Powers, fellow health committee member, and he and I can tell you that that's generally administration speak for we don't support the bill. You, you listed an objection here, which is uh, there are legal considerations that we must make into account. You really didn't go into depth at all on that. So what, what are the legal considerations that we need to take into account that would lead you not to support the bill as is? So first of all, we share the same goal. We are very sympathetic to this very difficult situation uh, that potentially many women are facing. But, and, and what is that goal? Our goal is to remove the information using a process that maintains the integrity of the birth certificate. Okay, well, my goal is to allow women who have been victims to remove the name of the abuser from the foundational document of their child without them having to go through uh, what can be a humiliating, public, complicated, difficult, and expensive process in the courts. And that is the kind of philosophy that led me in this committee and this council to very proudly pass legislation with the administration supported recently allowing New Yorkers to change their gender marker. And uh, the reason we passed that bill is so we didn't want to add undue obstacles to people who needed to change that document. So I'm not sure we share the same goal if you don't adhere to this philosophy of allowing victims to remove the name of their abuser without undue obstacles, cost, and public disclosure. We want to work with you on figuring that out. Okay, so tell me again, what are the legal considerations which we need to take into account? That So what our concern is with the changes that are made to any birth certificate are the legal implications that a, a registrant faces th throughout their life as they carry that certificate. We want that certificate to be respected by all other jurisdictions and other countries as it is now. Uh, we want to make sure that the process is one that's followed that maintains the integrity of the certificate. But every jurisdiction in the world, unless I'm wrong, does not require that the name of the delivering physician be on the certificate, Nor right? does New York City. Nor New York City's short form birth certificate does not have the name of the attendant on it. That is so easily who, who, available. So who's gonna reject the document because someone changed or removed the name of, of the physician? This, this is the short form birth certificate doesn't have the name of the information. I'm not, I'm not saying that the document will be rejected. I'm saying that we wanna work with you on a process that maintains the integrity of following the, the change uh, that is within a process that is maintaining the integrity of the birth certificate. But, but I don't understand how it loses integrity if there are many birth certificates long form which do not even include the name of a delivering physician and there are other jurisdictions which don't require it. And, and critically, this is not a subjective standard here. This is, the bill was designed to only allow a change in the case of the, of the medical provider having been, having lost their license by an accredited professional body. So there's a very clear standard. It's black and white. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to keep referring to the gender marker bill, and I want to repeat my strong and proud support of it, but in that case, um, we didn't require a physician uh, to pass judgment there, and 
the bill we're considering today actually does have a more stringent uh, standard, essentially, in that it does only apply in cases where the uh, medical provider has, has lost their license because of professional misconduct. So this doesn't apply if someone loses their license because they didn't take their continuing education credits or didn't pay whatever their annual dues are. It's more narrow than that, right? And maybe you know, but my understanding is this is not the kind of thing that happens often. Obstetricians are not having their license take away, taken away in New York City often. This is a narrow, clearly defined standard. So I, I don't understand how the document loses integrity. I don't understand what jurisdiction would have less faith in a New York City birth certificate if we pass this law. Just, I do want to acknowledge we've been joined by fellow health committee member, Dr. Matthew Eugene. The, all jurisdictions do require that the attendant or certifier is on the certificate. It's whether it's on the short form versus the long form. Like us, many jurisdictions don't include it on the short form. Um, the, the process of making a gender marker change is really different from any other process because there is no one externally in the world who can know a person's gender identity. Uh, and that's why the, the process in that fact is different from the other facts of birth. I'm actually not catching the logic there. Okay. So I, I, I think you're just validating my point. We rightly, because of the fact that gender is an internal, it's an internal matter of identity, we rightly have not required external validators. And that's, that's a bill that this body supports and you support it and we all agree on that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you believe that led the birth certificate documents to lose integrity in New York City. Of course. So now we have a bill with a, which does require an external validator. And there's, it's a different case and there are different reasons for that. But there is the presence of an external non-subjective standard, which is that the medical provider had lost their license or lost, was, was kicked out of the, the, the state board. So if it didn't cause us to lose integrity for gender markers, why would it cause us to lose integrity to list the name of the doctor? So I think that the, having the, the ruling by the state medical board is helpful, and we just need to know how to use it, to be directed how to use it, because it makes legal changes to the birth certificate, and we do want to work with you on figuring out how that should happen. It, it appears that your position is that, that uh, a mother who wants to remove the name of an abuser off the birth certificate should go to the courts. Is that right? That's, that's the, what we've had so far. That's the process in place. We want to work with you. This is extremely technical. It's, it's, um, it can be really confusing. We'd be really happy to work with you and get all the right people in the room to work with you on this, to work out the nitty-gritty details. Right. But, yes, that has been our process. That has been the only recourse until now. But in terms of going forward, the bill is attempting to give a, a less onerous route to the victims than going to the court, right? And, but your position is that the court should be the route that mothers go to. The, the court is the route that 12,000 people, of the 50,000 people make changes to their birth certificates every year. 12,000 people use of those changes require court orders, and they successfully do that, working with us every year. But ma many of those so, sorry, Commissioner. I mean, many of those are spelling changes because th they, are, they are less complicated and consequential. These actually and are adoptions, uh, paternity uh, amendments. These are extremely private, um, consequential changes to the birth certificate that well, are I'm not just regular, you know. I'm happy to work with my colleagues, perhaps, to craft, to, to craft legislation that would allow some of those New Yorkers to avoid the courts. We can talk about that at, at perhaps at a later date. But I think these are special cases. And I think that the desire for privacy in, in such cases, unless you have someone who's willing to be heroic, as Ms. Hochstetter has been, that the, the desire for privacy is really quite compelling and understandable. And that alone, to me, is reason enough to give people the option of 
avoiding the court. I, I do think that uh, there are financial costs associated with courts. You might have to hire an attorney. You uh, might have to take a day off work. I don't know the process. Maybe you can enlighten me. But, uh, and you might get a no at the end of the day. Uh, and that, that honestly, the, the, the legal system's track record in dealing with cases of sexual abuse, uh, uh, sexual abuse uh, has not been flawless, including in this specific case. Um, and so I could, I could understand uh, one, of the, one of the survivors preferring to avoid going to court for this. We want to help. We do have a process. We want to work with you to make it better. We want to work with the women to enable them to remove the... So, so yes, you, you, you've said that several times that you want to work with the women, that you, you support the women. So would you like to comment on what we heard from Ms. Hochstetter about her experience in the past year and a half or more uh, in dealing with the, depart with the health department? My, so I am, first of all, I'm so sorry that she had this experience, and I'm also, this is a horribly difficult situation, and I can very much understand that she wouldn't want to, um, you know, go through repeated attempts to, to make contact. Um, I have reviewed our contacts. The first contact that I see is um, from May of 2018, um, I'm very much going to look, follow up on the, the email that she referred to, the Dear Parents e email. It, that's not something I've ever heard of before. Um, so I, what I would want to do is to just reiterate that from my knowledge, um, our process is that we, we aim to respond to any corrections request within 30 days. The percent that's less than 30 days is low. Um, our goal is to have it be less than 5%. In 2018, the, it was less than 3%. Um, so we want to have a good customer service experience. To my knowledge, we heard um, about this case and replied to this case within a six-week period of time. Um, so, But I'm very much concerned about what she said, and I do want to further investigate it to see about the Dear Parents email. Um, it, this is going to be not the right forum to work out exactly what day, what type of content, contact was made, but the fact that someone with a New York birth certificate felt they had to resort to contacting a local city council member out of frustration and dealing with the health department, someone who's in a very, very difficult situation, to me, demonstrates a failure, and so I think in addition to us feeling really bad about uh, what this medical provider did to victimize Ms. Hochstetter, I think we also have to feel really bad and apologize for how the city responded to someone, uh, a survivor of abuse, who was taking a very difficult step even to reach out publicly on this. and. Uh, I want to know whether you share my view that the city also owes her an apology. My concern is that we always provide excellent customer service, and I am offer my apology in any situation in which we have not done that. Absolutely. Okay, well that was vaguer than I would have liked. I, our job is to focus on what the city does and what the city can do better, and I'm not proud of how the city has responded in this case. And in addition to figuring out a legislative solution to make this easier for other women, uh, I think we need to figure out what, how we respond to people who are survivors of abuse, whose abuser is on their birth certificate. Um, this is not a unique case. It's probably not the first time the health department's ever been contacted by a woman in this position. Just statistically, because of how many births there are a year, and the fact that this one doctor we know was in, was in practice for, I think, 20 years, and unfortunately, he is probably not the only person who has abused, only doctor who has abused women, so 
Um, I think we need to understand the protocol that the health departments have in place for responding when women are in the worst possible situation. And I th the appropriate response in my mind would have been a human being reaching out, not a form email, as soon as possible, and to say something along the lines of, if this is the case, which it appears to be, that currently the city's, uh, the laws of the city health bo board do not allow us to change this birth certificate without court approval, and we would like to work with you to fix that legislatively. And when the administration and the city council want to make, fix something legislatively, we can do it really fast. We can do it in a matter of weeks. But it took a lot longer than that because it required Ms. Hochstetter on her own finding her way to the office of the chair of the city council's health committee, in which case we could begin the health, the, the uh, legislative process. And, and here we are at the hearing and we're learning that you all don't support the bill. And I, I opened up by saying how stunned I am. I have to imagine that any mother out there who is looking for relief has got to be similarly st stunned uh, and, and, and surprised and baffled at this response. I'm going to pause now because uh, I want to acknowledge we've been joined by our fellow health committee member, Councilmember Alika Amprey Samuel, and I do think that Councilmember Powers um, has questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the testimony. A um, couple of questions. Um, for starters, you said you mentioned other jurisdictions. Do other jurisdictions both have the long form, short form, and do does every jurisdiction, it'll say every state, require the uh, attendance uh, uh, name and information on it? Yes, all jurisdictions require, it's in the federal guidance, it's in the U.S. standard birth certificate, so it's a standard of practice for all of the 57 vital records. And it's required or it's just standard practice? It's a, the U.S. standard certificate <coughs> is a model, and then each jurisdiction requires some type of medical certification. Right, and the a state, like New York State, for instance, could say we don't need the information, as we're, even as we're discussing here today, they don't, they're not required to require to ha, require, have the birth. Uh, New York in, State public health law also requires. But New York, I'm saying, New York, my point being the legislature could repeal that tomorrow, that's correct, and they would not be in violation of federal law? Uh, the fe the, I would we'd have to get back to you on the, the details of the federal law. Okay, and what is the purpose of having that information on there? Uh, a U.S., a, you know, a New York City birth certificate or a New York State birth certificate is proof of U.S. citizenship. Um, it is so given the full faith and credit of other governments, other jurisdictions, um, and so the, the, the certifier is swearing to all of the facts uh, on that certificate. They're, they are putting their medical license on the line, um, saying that everything on here is true. Okay, and the um, process today, the, w if you did want to get it amended for this scenario or for some other scenario, what is that process? If a woman uh, had this experience today and she gave birth, there are two different routes. The first route is that the hospital could say, please uh, not put, put the name of a different, one of the different attendants uh, onto that field in the birth certificate. That would be the simplest, cheapest way. It would be free. Uh, hospital, these are called hospital substitutions. Hospitals do this kind of change regularly. Um, the second way af after more time has elapsed is to go through the court process. And, and you, do, because time elapsed because they no longer can have confidence that they can certify with another name, is that correct? Well, it's after a year has elapsed, um, it's, it's, it's just a different process and that's just a matter of internal procedure. Okay, and so today you have to go to court if you want to get your name changed or redacted, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, but, and, and you can get it redacted? The, the name, this, in this particular case, we are saying that we agree that the name can be redacted through the existing process, which is the court order. Okay, and so if you can have it redacted, what is the consequence if you legislated a process versus requiring it go, to go through a court process to be redacted? What's the, what is the consequence to the individual if there's an existing process for redaction? The, the nuance and the difference is just the type of process. Okay. Um, 
So understanding the concerns from the Department of Health and the administration about, uh, about the bill, I don't know. I, I mean, I'd be, I am still unclear on what the concern is. There is a process today by which one can go through a court proceeding to have the name redacted that seems to have no consequence to the individual, as I understand it, but I stand corrected, if there are consequences in the real world by having the name redacted. Um, but there is a process. We are asking for there to be a law to allow for it if under a, under a very particular condition. Is there a process outside of the court process that you feel is more appropriate than if, if instead of going to court, what is it, what is, is there another substitute process that should be in place? As I mentioned, I think working with the hospital directly is, would be the most efficient way. And it, that's, but after a year, you can, is that correct? Typically. Okay, so, so if, if it's within a year, you go to the hospital. If you go, if it's after the year, you go to court. That sounds like a process. So let's say, imagine in all scenarios, or let's say in any scenario where you're, out, you're over a year, the hospital's not an available option for you anymore. So court is your option. As the, as the chair mentioned, that, that, that requires hiring a lawyer, and I don't, know, I don't know the exact proceeding that you go through, but that seems like a bit much to ask somebody to go for when they come and tell a story like some, the one that we heard today. It seems like the department, you know, I, I still, so let me, let me take a second. What is the consequence to redacting your name on your, uh, redacting the attendance name on the birth certificate? So if there is an existing process to do that. So, so the, the, just to reiterate, there is, a ver, there is a short form birth certificate that we issue thousands and thousands of every year that does not include the attendance name on it. That's what most people get. Mm -hmm. That's what most people request. That's what people use to get a passport or to get a driver's license to go to school, those kinds of things. Um, this other form, this long form birth certificate can be redacted through a court order process. And the reason why that we, we have a court order process is because uh, we want to make sure that all of the, the information on there, that people can look at that form and know that it's, uh, if there's a legal consequence, it has been changed under, with a legal consideration. We want a legal judgment. We're asking the court to direct us because we want that legal judgment and we want the expectation for all of the information on the certificate to have that, that high bar, that expectation of information and that knowledge. You want the court to make a determination that the information that you're redacting is correct and legal? Is that? It should be, that it should be done. Should be done. Got it. What are situations or historically where people have been able to get the information redacted? Like, redacted? Or, and how often, I guess? Um, well, in this, this is the very first instance that we've ever been contacted in my memory and the memory of my colleagues um, asking for an attendance name to be redacted. So it's never happened before? That's correct. Okay. So, so we are, the process is hypothetical about going to the court. Well, right. What we've done is if we, we, what we do is we, we have 50,000 corrections every year. Occasionally, the one that comes out of sort of left field, um, a different direction that we haven't faced before. And in general, when we have those kinds of corrections, we ask people to work through the court process because it cr creates a consistency um, for making the change across all different types of iterations. And it, it'll, it allows people to have confidence that the birth certificate maintains its integrity um, and if there's a legal consequence, if there's a legal consideration, if something's legally complex, the courts have considered it. Okay, so there's 50,000 individuals who go to court every year for some- 12,000, oh, actually. 12, 000, yeah, sorry. 50,000 make corrections. A lot of them don't require court orders. Gotcha, okay. Um, and this is the first one by which you've seen somebody ask for the birth attendant's name to be taken right. off. Okay, got yes. it. Do you think there are, just anecdotally, believe there are other instances out there? There must be. I completely believe uh, that, that this must be not only something that um, must exist, but that more people, as Ms. Huxeter said, will come forward. I think it's, it's good that we develop a process and have worked together to figure out the right process to, to go through in these circumstances. So let's say we, let's say, and that's maybe my last question, sorry. Let's say the chairman uh -huh. did want to work out a process with you. What would that process look like? I think that what we should do is, it's very technical, and we should take it into a, 
a different setting where we're talking about how to make this process work the best, uh, to be as transparent and as useful as possible to the people involved, to the women involved. The one uh, comment I'd add to that is that um, it, it, it sounds like, based on where we are from, in, in, from the testimony and from the, the questions and answers, that that process is going to essentially be the same process, which is going to be go to court. So if we are saying, let's work out a process together to figure out how to do this, it sounds like the preference here, though, is to still have people go through the process by which. So, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to mean say this in a, in a, in a, I don't mean, I don't want this to come off the wrong way, but it sounds a bit like we're saying, let's work this out, off, you know, out of the hearing, which is totally fine and reasonable, but we're, but we're basically going to end up in the same place, which would be then disingenuous to say, let's work out a process together. Actually, we we were reviewing this matter and re in reviewing the. the the concept of the, the change, um, and this has, process has moved along very quickly, so we haven't had a, the full opportunity to explore how this could be fixed. Um, so I... So you, but you do envision that there could be a, a process put in place to help address a scenario like this one? I do, I do. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member Powers. I mean, you, you say the process moved quickly, but when you acknowledge hearing uh, even if you accept that you didn't hear from Ms. Hoxtetter until May, that's seven months, and I'm not sure when exactly we introduced the bill, but this didn't happen overnight, right? You, you, you repeatedly said that a woman could simply get the hospital to write a letter, but no hospital is going to want to do that because they're potentially admitting that, that one of their employees committed the crime. Right? You, you cannot have a system that relies on the hospitals where the abuser works accommodating here because uh, it could implicate the hospital. In this case, the hospital is being sued, uh, uh, probably very appropriately. And so th th a system that relies on the hospital essentially admitting guilt, admitting guilt is, is, is uh, destined to fail. It's, it's a system that requires the hospital to admit that it made an error in reporting a piece of information to us, no more or less. But, but made an error in reporting. But, if, but how is that an error in reporting if the person who attended the birth is on the current birth certificate? That person is an abuser, but that is who was in the room. Th there are typically a number of people in a room at a time of birth that could be appropriate people to be. So this, so this is only an out if there's another individual in the room, uh, a nurse or something, mm -hmm. uh, which wouldn't always be the case, but could be in some. Mm -hmm. And while I understand technically they're only admitting an error, uh, one could really understand why a hospital would, would, be, would, would have disincentives to cooperate in that way. Uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to me to be a fail-safe solution. And at any rate, I think you explained that it, 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 that, that solution is only available for a year. Is that right? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The hospital substitution is available for a year. But in this particular case, or in these particular cases, it could be something that we could explore. Right, but there are going to be, I mean, this, this doctor in question himself was practicing for 20 years. And there may be women who come forward now because they hear about this bill or, or have read the coverage of this case, uh, it sounds like you're saying you'd offer accommodation uh, to the one year, but... Again, this is, this is getting into the technical nitty-gritty of how a process would work, which we would feel more appropriate to work with you in a different setting. Well, this is, that's getting into the technical nitty-gritty of the hospital writing a letter to make the change, but that's actually not the heart of this bill. We, the, the goal of the bill is that the health department itself, the vital records unit itself, can grant this change. Uh, you, at a number of points, have cited state law around this, the state health code, correct? New York public health law, but and the New York city health code. The, well, the, the New York public health law, which is a state or, or city? S state. But is the city not exempt? from state public health law re related to this matter? So I would want to defer to counsel on any getting into the depth of the... Well, 
<laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, okay. Consulted. Right. I mean, it's Public Health Law 4100. Uh, duties of the department commissioner, et cetera, et cetera. The department shall, comma, except in the case of the city of New York. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but it seems like we're empowered here. The city is empowered here in a way that no other part of, no other jurisdiction in the state is. So I don't understand why you keep citing the state law if we're empowered to do it our own way. So we, for, for many fields of the certificate, uh, we do have state, that we are an independent vital records jurisdiction, but we are bound in certain matters by state law. Right, but we're not, we're not bound by the state uh, standards because of the way the law is written. Um, I have one piece of information that I think illustrates why the courts are not the right option, which is we had our committee counsel uh, call two courts today, uh, Supreme Court and Civil Court, to ask uh, about changing uh, or removing the name of the intendant from their uh, birth documents. And the courts both said uh, that this is a matter that must be decided by the health department. Now, I'm not saying that they are right. We do believe a law needs to change for you to do that. But it illustrates just, it's just one example of the kind of obstacle that a mother facing this challenge would have to face. That now a well-informed, someone who was a, a survivor who was well-informed, who knew their rights, who knew the process, perhaps could surmount that and ask to talk to a supervisor or cite some sort of uh, legal, legal uh, documents. But it's just, it's just one data point, too, because, because she called two courts today about the, the, the inadequacy of this as an option. D does that vignette surprise you at all or bother you? It concerns me and I do want, I want to work with you to figure out the right way to move forward. Okay. We want to do that as well. I'm as confident in the, the bill now as I was uh, two hours ago. Um, I, I firmly believe this is the right thing to do. I don't think it diminishes the integrity of the document. I don't think that steering survivors to the courts is the right answer. I don't think that's an acceptable answer. I think that what we just did, thankfully, on gender markers is a helpful and instructive case that can guide us on this, in which case the philosophy was to reduce the barriers when someone needs to make an important change to this document, which has practical and symbolic power throughout someone's life. And we're going to continue to push on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we, we actually have a very short attend list of uh, witnesses today, and this will uh, conclude our hearing. Thank you.